Well, greetings from Cooperstown, New York, home of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. We're glad you could join us today for a uh, special edition of one of our virtual programs. Today is a program where we will look back at um, a major event in American history. Uh, happened 80 years ago, the attack on Pearl Harbor, which essentially led to America's entrance into World War II. We are going to look specifically at the very strong connection between World War II and baseball. We'll examine some of the players, including some of our most legendary Hall of Famers who served in the military during uh, the uh, balance of the war, uh, discuss exactly what they were doing during wartime and how it very much had an effect on their careers. So that'll be coming up momentarily. Uh, we do also want to direct you to our Zoom group chat room. If you go there, you'll see our welcoming message. We will take questions about today's topic right in the chat, so you can post your comments and questions there. Also, we remind you that we are recording this program so they can be viewed by other folks uh, later on. Before we get to today's program, though, I do want to mention that we have another special program coming up later in the week. On Thursday, December the 9th, also at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, we're going to talk to our new Hall of Fame president, Josh Rawich. Josh will offer his thoughts on the ERA committee vote over the weekend. Uh, that added six new Hall of Famers to our roles here. Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about what it's been like for Josh these first few months on the job as he officially took over in September. He actually officially took over the day after our 2021 induction ceremony. So again, that program coming up with Josh Rawich, and that'll be uh, this Thursday, December the 9th at 2 p.m. If you want to find out more about these and other programs, just visit our website. Uh, you can find that at baseballhall.org, baseballhall.org. We also want to thank our sponsor. Uh, they have been generously supporting us throughout 2021. That is the Ford Motor Company. All of our virtual programs brought to you through the uh, generosity of Ford Motor. So we thank them for their support throughout all of 2021. Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, today marks the 80th anniversary of one of the worst days in American history, those surprise attacks on Pearl Harbor. We're gonna take a look at this strong connection between World War II and the game of baseball. First, we'll talk a little bit about some of these specific events of December 7th, 1941. It was on that day that the Imperial Japanese Naval Air Service staged a surprise attack on the United States Naval Base located at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The attack resulted in the deaths of more than 2,400 Americans also, over 1,000 Americans were injured that day as well. Now, the very next day, December 8th, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt asked Congress to declare war on Japan. This would affect pretty much every aspect of American society, and baseball was not exempt from this. More than 70 Hall of Famers would serve in the military at wartime. Uh, now, uh, or actually, I should say, um, in total, in terms of the history of all the different wars that have happened, more than 70 have served in the military in wartime. That would be Civil War, World War I, World War II, Korean War. But in terms specifically of World War II, 38 of those 70 Hall of Famers served during the war years, World War II, 1941 to 1945. And I should mention that the 38 Hall of Famers who served in World War II, that includes two of our newest electees to the Hall of Fame, Gil Hodges and Buck O'Neill, uh, both voted in by the uh, Golden Days Committee on Sunday. Now the list of 38 Hall of Fame veterans of World War II Include some of the game's most legendary figures, people like Hank Greenberg, Jackie Robinson, Bob Feller, Ted Williams, Warren Spahn. And we're going to talk specifically about those five men during the course of our program. Now, by the end of the war, by the time uh, uh, 
it came to an end in 1945. Over 500 major leaguers, 4,000 minor leaguers, which is just a staggering number, and also 230 Negro Leagues players, whom we now consider major leaguers as well, they all would serve the nation during World War II. And this was in all theaters of the war, uh, Europe, the Pacific. So on this, the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, we honor those who lost their lives that day. We also honor the ballplayers who made subsequent sacrifices during World War II. Now, here is what essentially initiated baseball's involvement with the effort in World War II. This is a document that is now sometimes referred to as the red light letter. And this letter was dated January 14th, 1942, just five weeks after Pearl Harbor. The letter is now housed at the FDR Presidential Library and Museum located in Hyde Park, uh, New York. Uh, and we did a program uh, with them, um, it was roughly about a year ago. Uh, so they have that particular letter. Now, this was a letter that was sent from the commissioner of baseball, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, to the American president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Let's give you a close up of the letter so that you can read it a little bit better off the screen. Here is essentially what Landis wrote to FDR. Inasmuch as these are not ordinary times, I venture to ask what you have in mind as to whether baseball should continue to operate. So that's a direct quote from this letter itself. Essentially, Landis is acknowledging that many of the young men playing the game of baseball, they're going to be moving on to the military service. And in the letter, Landis goes on to write, of course, my inquiry does not relate at all to the individual members of this organization whose status in the emergency is fixed by law operating upon all citizens. Essentially what Landis was saying here is he was making it very clear to President FDR that baseball was not asking for any special favors. Baseball understood that none of their players would be exempt from service-related duties. And he essentially was confirming the uh, accepted idea, this patriotic support of the nation at war. So there was no questioning from Landis about the fact that every baseball player fit to serve should serve. That was not the question. What the commissioner was doing in this red light letter he was simply asking President Roosevelt if the game should continue with whatever resources they could muster. There was concern that with so many major league players and minor league players being called into various uh, areas of the war, that there might not be enough players to sustain major league baseball, the quality of play might not be good enough, the, the sheer number of players might not be there to support the idea that baseball would continue as an active game. So Landis really wanted to find out from FDR, do you think we should keep going or should we spend operations? Maybe for part of the 1942 season, maybe all of the 1942 season, maybe even beyond that. So he was looking for some guidance on this. Well, almost immediately after receiving the letter from the commissioner, this is the response that was formulated by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And this is what we call the famous green light letter. And this is part of our collection here at the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, in fact, we have a copy of this that is on display, but we also have the original letter in our collection as well. Now, one thing that's interesting, kind of a backstory here, is that FDR and Landis really didn't get along all that well on a personal level. Uh, they came from different political backgrounds. They had different philosophies. So there was a little bit of a personality clash 
but you can tell in each letter that's being sent out, they're kind of trying to be as polite as they can be with each other because they understand there's a greater cause here. They didn't want to let those personal feelings get in the way of this very important decision as to whether baseball should continue. So this is the response that was sent by FDR. You'll notice how he begins it very politely, my dear judge. And let's focus on the second and third paragraphs, which really are the most important parts of the document. And here's what FDR wrote. I honestly feel that it would be best for the country to keep baseball going. There will be fewer people unemployed and everybody will work longer hours and harder than ever before. FDR goes on to write, and that means they ought to have a chance for recreation and for taking their minds off their work even more than before. So this is why we call it the green light letter. This is essentially FDR giving Landis permission, the go ahead to keep the game going. Now, it's interesting that the way the letter is worded, this is not a, an order or a command, but if you're Commissioner Landis and you're reading between the lines, I mean, it's pretty clear what FDR wants to happen. And it's not likely that a commissioner of baseball or a commissioner of any of the sport is going to go against the wishes of the American president. So Landis essentially took this as um, a suggestion, a strong suggestion, that it is important to keep baseball going. Um, FDR felt that, yeah, there are enough players that we can do this, but more importantly, even though we've lost many of our top players to the war effort, it's important to give the American people a diversion, a source of entertainment, something to keep their morale up, something to keep uh, kind of a moral support. And he may have even thought, you know, this is something that might be good for the soldiers, uh, those men called into battle. Um, they're not going to be getting baseball updates every day, uh, but periodically they would get news from the states. And that could be welcome news during a very uh, difficult uh, time in the lives of these men serving as soldiers. So clearly FDR felt this was the right thing to keep the game going. This was his strong suggestion. And this is ultimately what Landis ended up doing. So baseball did not suspend operations, not for any period of time. Uh, the game did continue. Now there were a number of minor leagues that had to stop play because they did not have enough players. Some of their teams simply could not make a go of it. But in terms of the major leagues, the American League, the National League, the 16 established major league teams, they all continued to operate, not business as usual or business as normal, but business to the best of their ability, uh, given the circumstances. Now, it's interesting to look at some other documents that we have here at the Hall of Fame that showcase this relationship between baseball and the World War II effort. What we have here is a clipping from uh, a newspaper, something called the Blanchard Press in New York. And essentially, this is something that would have been given to fans uh, or signage at the ballpark that would have indicated to fans what they need to do in the case of an air raid taking place during a major league game. Now, that never actually occurred, but Certainly the possibility was there and the baseball teams and the ballparks, the people running these ballparks, they wanted to make sure that uh, everybody attending a game had an idea of what to do. So here we have air attack regulations that were put up for one of the ballparks. So for fans in the upper grandstand, the note to them said spectators in rear of line of supporting columns will remain in their seats. Those forward of the columns, including the box seats, will be evacuated over the prescribed route to main corridors under the upper stand. Fans in the mezzanine, all spectators will remain in their seats. Lower grandstand, all those in the rear of line of supporting columns remain in seats. Those forward of columns, including those in field boxes, 
will take shelter under lower stand through designated exits. And then finally, the fans in the bleachers, all spectators, will move to the alert area under bleacher stands and will use designated exits. Now, this notice goes on to say this park is not bomb proof, but as safe as elsewhere. If you hear a warbling siren note, be guided by the instructions on the label opposite your seat. If it reads, sit tight. So these are additional instructions that are located next to the seats. If it reads, sit tight, you will be expected to do just that during an air attack. If the label should read, follow green arrow or follow red arrow, a red arrow you will be expected to comply with these instructions. Above all, do not run, do not shout. So here we see the specific instructions laid out to all fans in the case of a worst case scenario, an air attack taking place in a city where a major league ball game is going on at that moment. Here's another interesting item that we can find in our collection. It's a ticket to a major league game that took place in 1942, again, that uninterrupted season. It's a Boston Braves game, September 9th of 1942. And you can see in the yellow circle, there's a provision here. It's free admission to the grandstand or the pavilion to any member of the US Armed Forces wearing a uniform. So if we have a member of the military who is stateside for whatever reason, they are given free admission to the ballpark. They are allowed to sit in the grandstand or the pavilion without being charged at all. So uh, another interesting item. Also, another document worth note, after World War II, veterans of the war received a lifetime admission pass to major league ballparks. Now it's a little bit hard to read on your screen, but what it says is this, in gratitude for service rendered our country in World War II, the courtesy of all major and minor league parks is extended for life. This pass belonged to a soldier named Kenneth R. Young. He was not a baseball player, um, but he was an American soldier, veteran of the war, and he received one of these passes, um, as did any veteran of the Second World War. And it was good not just for the major league ballparks, but also for minor league parks as well, a lifetime admissions pass. So those just a few of the items that we can find in the collection here at our Hall of Fame and Museum. Now let's talk about some of the great individual players who served during the Second World War. And we're gonna begin with Hall of Fame first baseman, Hank Greenberg. Now it's interesting, Hank Greenberg actually enlisted in the army prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor. He enlisted in the army back in 1940. Then at the age of 30, he is given his official discharge, an honorable discharge by the army. And it's December the 5th, 1941. Yeah, that's two days before the attack on Pearl Harbor. So Greenberg was all set to leave the military. He had done his duty. He had done it honorably. He's getting set to uh, uh, essentially um, go back to a more normal routine at his home, prepare for the 1942 season. But then two days after his discharge, we have the attack on Pearl Harbor. Well, seven weeks after the attack in Hawaii, Greenberg re-enlists as a sergeant in the Army Air Force. And he eventually would rise to the rank of first lieutenant. He headed a group that scouted bombing targets for B-29s. Now his service time for World War II ended up lasting an amazing 47 months. So if you include his, his first tenure before Pearl Harbor and then the time after Pearl Harbor, 47 months, almost four full years. And this was the longest tenure served by any professional ball player, major league or minor league, during the Second World War. Hank Greenberg ended up missing the equivalent of three complete baseball seasons and parts of two others. So a considerable sacrifice in terms of what would have been prime years 
of his baseball career. Three complete baseball seasons and parts of two others. And even with all that time missed, his career statistics, still phenomenal, still clearly put him on the track for the Baseball Hall of Fame. Next up, let's talk about Jackie Robinson, who also served with distinction. Now, Robinson never actually saw combat during World War II, but he did become an officer. He became a lieutenant in the United States Army. And one of the things that is somewhat well remembered about his time in the Army is a racially charged incident that took place. And it's something very similar to what would happen with Rosa Parks 11 years later. Now, just to review, 1955, Rosa Parks makes history when she refuses to give up her seat to a white passenger on a public bus. Well, 11 years before most of the country had ever heard of Rosa Parks, 1944, Jackie Robinson does something fairly similar. He boards a military bus and he's wearing his lieutenant's uniform, similar to what you see in the image on the left side of your screen. Now, there were empty seats in the front of the bus. Robinson went to sit in one of those empty seats near the front. The bus driver, though, was uh, rather upset with him, angry, unsympathetic toward Robinson. He said, listen, uh, you're black. You're going to have to sit in the back of the bus. Well, Robinson refused on the basis that he was an officer in the U.S. Army. This was a military bus, and he had the right to sit wherever he wanted, wherever there was an empty seat. So Robinson did not let this go. And as a matter of principle and really doing the right thing, um, he became engaged in a verbal argument with the driver. The driver ended up filing a formal complaint against Jackie Robinson. The case actually went to military court, but there the military tribunal found Robinson was not guilty on all charges. He was found to have done absolutely nothing wrong. He was simply standing up for his own personal and civil rights. So not guilty was the determination in the military court. And this ended up being perhaps another factor in why Branch Rickey, three years later, would essentially select Jackie Robinson as the first black player to break through the color barrier. He actually signed him in the fall of 1945, sent him to AAA Montreal in 46, but then in 1947, promoted him to the opening day roster, made his debut in the major leagues April 15th, 1947, essentially ending this color ban, color barrier that had been in place since the year 1887. So we see Jackie Robinson, uh, another Hall of Famer, another veteran of World War II. Then we have maybe the two most celebrated baseball players to serve in the war. Uh, both were veterans, at least initially, of the United States Navy. We see Bob Feller on the left, and we see fellow Hall of Famer Ted Williams on the right. Williams would later transfer uh, to the Marines. Let's begin the story here with Bob Feller. It was two days after the bombing of Pearl Harbor that Bob Feller uh, essentially became the first professional athlete to join the war effort enlisting in the Navy. He was actually driving back to his home in the Midwest. He heard reports about the attack on Pearl Harbor. Pretty much from that moment, he decided that he was going to enlist and as soon as he physically could do so, well, that's exactly what he did. So he was the first baseball player, first major professional athlete uh, to voluntarily join the war effort after the attack at Pearl Harbor. So he enlists in the Navy. He is assigned to the USS Alabama as a gun captain. And one of his jobs or a primary job as part of the USS Alabama crew is to escort American ships in the North Atlantic, also, the USS Alabama, they took part in eight invasions in the South Pacific. So Bob Feller was right in the midst of that. Now, we should point out the Alabama, 
despite taking part in all these invasions, never lost a single man during its commission in World War II. Feller, emerging as an American hero, though he would very much disagree with that terminology, and I'll talk about that in a moment, he earned five campaign ribbons and eight battle stars. Now, he also ended up missing three full seasons of his career, plus part of another season. So again, another athlete, like Hank Greenberg in the midst of his career. Jackie Robinson was, of course, just about ready to begin his career in the major leagues, although he had not yet signed with the Brooklyn Dodgers at the time that he entered the U.S. Army. But here we have Feller, like Greenberg, in the middle of their careers, essentially taken out of the game and put into the field of action. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that Bob Feller deserves recognition as an American hero. But I know from having interviewed Bob uh, many times, uh, I think I've interviewed Bob more times than any other Hall of Famer, which was a tribute to the fact that he never missed an induction. He came here every summer for the ceremony and oftentimes came here in the winter, in the early spring, whenever we asked him to do a program, if Bob was physically able to be here, he would do it for us. Uh, he was a great supporter of the Hall of Fame. And along the way, I got to interview him numerous times. Not every time did we talk about World War II, but we, we talked about it at least two or three times. And he always made a point of saying that he didn't want to be referred to as a hero. He felt that he was not a hero. He felt the true heroes were the soldiers who never made it back, the soldiers who lost their lives. And he said that every time, whenever he talked about World War II. Um, not to say that he wasn't proud of what he did in the war. He certainly was. Not to say that it wasn't a very significant part of his life. Um, but he always refused acceptance of the term hero for himself. He felt that should be reserved only uh, for the men who died in action during World War II. So that's Bob Feller's involvement. Let's talk now about Ted Williams. Ted Williams served in World War II beginning in May of 1942. That is when he enlisted in the United States Navy. And then he was called to duty in November. Now he joined something that was called the V-5 program in hopes of becoming a naval aviator. And he immediately trained as a fighter pilot. And in the training, he was outstanding. He set multiple records for hits, shooting from wingovers, zooms, and barrel rolls. His records for student gunnery uh, still stand today in terms of reflexes, coordination, and visual reaction time. Now, he did not actually serve in battle during World War II. This was all done in training sessions, although that did involve an element of danger in and of itself. Now, after he does his tour of duty in World War II, he is finally discharged January of 1946. Well, his status would change February of 1953, seven years later. That is when Williams was called to Korea as a pilot. Now, we should mention that Ted did this somewhat reluctantly. He felt he had done his service during World War II he felt it was unfair to now be drawn into the Korean War, but ultimately he ended up doing what he was told. Um, the Marines recalled a number of their pilots to active duty. Williams was just one of them. Williams was a captain in the reserve. Now he was about to turn 34. Uh, he was married uh, to Doris. He had a young daughter as well. Uh, so he was a family man for many reasons. You can understand why he was reluctant, but ultimately he followed orders. He did what he was told. Um, that was what he uh, pursued at that point. So he ends up becoming an active part of the Korean War. He actually flew as the wingman to the great John Glenn on more than a half dozen missions. On one occasion, William's fighter plane was shot up. The engine was uh, shot up so badly it would not function. So manually, he had to make an emergency crash landing in the field 
a field nearby. Um, but he was able to maneuver and make that landing without a functioning engine. And then he was able to escape from the plane before it set fire and, and literally uh, burned in front of him. Uh, miraculously, he suffered only very minor injuries. And really the only reason that he survived was because of his extraordinarily uh, good piloting skills. So pretty amazing um, what Ted Williams, what, accomplish, what he accomplished during the Korean War. Overall, if you include both Korea and World War II and looking at Ted Williams, he missed three full baseball seasons and he also missed parts of two others to military service. Then we have the story that maybe is not as well known as Ted Williams and Bob Feller, and that is the story of the great left-hander Warren Spahn, who served in the U.S. Army. Spahn fought in the legendary, snowy, frozen Battle of the Bulge. Horrific experience. Took place from December 16th, 1944 to January 25th of 1945. During the Battle of the Bulge, Warren Spahn was nicked by bullets, both the abdomen and also the back of the head. But he was able to recover from uh, his major injuries. He earned a bronze star, he earned a purple heart, he was given a battlefield promotion, and he was also eventually given a presidential citation for his service. Warren Spahn ended up missing three full seasons and a part of a fourth major league season. So another amazing tenure for one of these great baseball players during World War II. Now, of the more than 500 major leaguers who served in World War II, thankfully, most were able to make it home. Unfortunately, though, there were two exceptions. There were two men who did not. And they're shown on your screen here. We have Elmer Gedeon and Harry O'Neill. Elmer Gedeon was an officer in the United States Army. He flew a number of missions in the European theater of battle. He was shot down and killed uh, during a flight over France. Harry O'Neill was a Marine. He became a first lieutenant, uh, suffered a number of injuries and initially did survive them, but then later was killed by a sniper at Iwo Jima. So he lost his life as well. So these were the two major leaguers. There were also a number of minor leaguers who lost their lives. But the two major leaguers who died in battle during World War II, Elmer Gedeon and Harry O'Neill. Just to put things in perspective, Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, 80 years ago. Uh, many of the baseball players that took part in the war, 1942, 43, 44, 45. So we're talking almost 80 years ago. Most of the major league players who served in World War II no longer with us, so much time has passed. However, to our knowledge, there are eight major leaguers who are veterans of World War II that are still living. You may have heard of some of these names. Uh, Carl Erskine, great pitcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers, teammate of the newly elected Hall of Famer Gil Hodges. Carl Erskine is one of the eight major leaguers who is still a survivor, still living to this day all these years later. Uh, others on the list, Bill Greason, uh, Chris Howie, Ed Mickelson, Larry Miggins, Bobby Morgan, Frank Soche, and Bobby Shantz, the great left-hander who pitched for Philadelphia, among other teams. So those are the eight major league players uh, that do uh, remain with us. Uh, they are still around, still with us, nearly 80 years after their service in World War II. Um, we do have a few minutes remaining in our program. We do want to take any questions that you might have in our chat room. So go to the Zoom group chat. You can type in question or a comment. I'll try to answer that question to the best of my ability. Uh, we do have a question coming in from Stephen. He wants to know, uh, so an old World War II vet could still get in free. Wonder what happens when they show up with one of those at the stadium. Well, yeah, as long as uh, that veteran retained that pass that was given to them at the end of World War II, 
that veteran would be allowed to gain access to a major league or a minor league ballpark. So um, if any of the, the eight survivors that we just mentioned still go to games to this day, as long as they have that pass or some sort of a documentation of having been a veteran of World War II, then yes, they would receive uh, admission to uh, the ballpark. Um, that was something that um, was started uh, with World War II and it does continue to this day, um, at least in theory, for those uh, eight men that are still with us. Um, of course, all of them up in years now, uh, but uh, some of them may still be active and uh, might still go to ball games, uh, even in 2021. As we put things in perspective, 80 years later, you think about professional athletes, and wartime today. Draft, of course, does not exist anymore. It is fairly rare for professional athletes, not only in baseball, but really any of the major sports. It's pretty rare for any of them to serve in the active military during wartime. It was obviously a much different world in 1941 and in 1942. Um, there were players who were called upon. They uh, essentially were not given a choice. Many of them you know, did so voluntarily. They certainly um, had to have fears. Any reasonable person would, but many of them, like a Bob Feller, felt that this was an important duty, an important obligation, and felt that uh, it was a cause that needed to be addressed. They needed to participate. And this was the sacrifice that many of these athletes uh, willingly made. And uh, it's remarkable, the accomplishments. Um, a number of the players did make a return to the major leagues. There were some players though, uh, while they survived the war, they suffered major injuries or major medical conditions that would prevent them from playing in major league baseball again, or, or prevent them from maybe playing as effectively Two of the names that come to mind, there was a, a player named Lou Brissy who suffered major injuries to his legs, his ankle. Uh, he actually uh, had numerous surgeries and made an incredible comeback. He had, before the war, was a top prospect. Um, he was not the same player after these injuries. They certainly cut into his playing skill, but he worked extremely hard and he did make a comeback to the major leagues. Um, then there was a player like Cecil Travis who had been an outstanding shortstop um, and he suffered from a condition they call frozen feet um, exposure. His feet um, were exposed to incredibly extreme weather conditions. Uh, this ended up being a permanent condition and it affected his ability. He was not the same player after World War II. So there certainly were some players uh, whose physical conditions were affected. Uh, but it's amazing how so many more players were able to make it back. Um, they were able to recover from their injuries, both physical and emotional injuries, and were able to make a comeback in some cases, two, three, four, or five years after they had last played a major league game. Uh, let's see, we have some more questions uh, coming in. Uh, we have a question from Beatles 4. Greetings from Williamsport. Yeah, that's home of Little League Baseball. Is there any veteran designation on the Hall of Fame members plaque? Great presentation. Thank you. Well, we thank Beatles 4 for that. Yes, um, there is a designation. It's not specifically on the plaque, but any Hall of Famer who served in World War II, World War I, the Korean War, the Civil War, any war, any player who was in the active military during wartime, any Hall of Famer, they have a small medallion that is placed underneath the plaque in the plaque gallery. It's a circular medallion and it indicates their military service. And it also, it indicates the specific branch of the military, whether it's Army, Navy, Marines, what have you. So yes, um, and there are over 70 Hall of Famers who served 
at wartime. Uh, there were none who served in the American Revolution. That's going back a little bit too far. But um, there was a Hall of Famer who served in the Civil War. Numerous Hall of Famers in World War I and World War II, also the Korean War. We talked about Ted Williams earlier. At this point, there have not been any Hall of Famers who served in Vietnam. Now, there were a number of major league players who did see action in Vietnam. Um, they took part in battles, but at this point, none of those players um, have ever made the Hall of Fame. But we do have Hall of Fame veterans uh, from the Civil War, both World Wars, and also from the Korean War as well. Well, I wanna thank folks for the questions that have come in. Um, you can also certainly continue to post questions if you have follow-ups at our education email, and that is available at our website, baseballhall.org. We wanna thank everybody for joining us during the course of our program today. As we look back 80 years ago, Pearl Harbor, World War II, and the connection to the game of baseball. Also, a reminder, our next virtual program is coming up in just two days. It'll be on December the 9th, 2 p.m. Eastern time. We will talk to our new Hall of Fame president, Josh Rawich, about what his first few months on the job have been like. He'll give us his thoughts on his first era committee vote that he's ever been through. Uh, Josh was down in Orlando, Florida on Sunday when those committee meetings took place. And we'll also look forward to 2022 Josh's plans for the Hall of Fame and Museum as we look ahead toward a new year here in Cooperstown. So again, that's coming up in just two days, Thursday, December 9th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. We thank all of you for joining us today. We also thank our generous sponsor, the Ford Motor Company, for their financial support. We do appreciate them as well. Thanks, everybody, for being part of this remembrance. 80 years later, Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. We thank you for being with us. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.